I have a severe genetic condition that flares up every time I try to plug in my garage lights, which inevitably results in a redneck backwater version of the Nutcracker that would make Shakespeare cry. So as to not disappoint Big S anymore, I started looking around my garage for something I could use that would help me reach the ceiling when I found the perfect item. At first the motor didn't really seem to help, but then I remembered motors are really good at spinning, and if I could somehow harness the spinach, I could use it to levitate towards the ceiling and no longer make a fool out of myself. So the plan for today is to make an elevator. No, the other kind of elevator. No, what, what is that? That's not... Yes, that's what I, yeah, that's. There are a couple of problems with this idea. For one, I'll always be a fool, especially for the city. And fourthly, this motor is very, very weak. Extensive scientific testing shows that the torque value on the motor is less than the motor weight itself, and equivalent to roughly four succulent beans. So how on earth is this tiny, weak, $1 motor going to lift all 223 pounds of my curvaceous being? I embroiled my cranium in a severe weather event session and came up with a few ideas, but first I need to figure out how fast this thing spins. I wasn't sure about the best way to measure the speed, so I brought my pen and paper out to count the rotations manually, which I think was pretty darn accurate. But just to be sure, I put a sharpie on another motor to count the first motor's rotation, but that idea failed before it even started. So I decided to cheat and use slow-mo, but analyzing the footage frame by frame proved to be too fast-mo for me to accurately find the speed. For those keeping score at home, I now have two problems. The motor is too fast for me to measure, and it isn't even close to having enough torque. So there I sat trying to solve both issues at the same time, with my wheel spinning, my gears turning, but no light bulb. <gasps> That's it. Gears. Gears solve all of my problems. If I drive a small gear against a big gear, mechanical black magic occurs and the big gear has a higher torque but slower speed. The difference in amount of teeth between the two gears is what some may call the gear ratio. I printed these gears with a car to unicycle ratio, so the big gear should have four times the amount of torque with four times less speed than the small gear. So I set up a little test to see if I could get the big gear to turn using the cheapo motor. I still needed to find the motor speed, and I hoped by clearly marking the big gear it would be slow enough to capture the speed, but alas, me camera weren't up to snuff. What? I did get to see some gyroscopic effect Whoa. in action though, so that was pretty cool. Yeah. Like most of us, in the end I turned to divine intervention, sometimes referred to as a data sheet, to figure out the speed of the motor under load and torque. And after doing some edge of the napkin calculations to find out the gear ratio for the torque required to lift me, it turns out if I use this small gear on the motor, I will need a big gear with 8.4 million teeth and a diameter of 350,000 feet, which is about 3% of the moon's diameter. Now I thought this would be a pretty standard gear, but I had a really hard time finding it until I stumbled upon this website called JLCMC which had exactly what I was looking for. Okay, maybe they don't have a gear with millions of teeth, but they do have millions of dollars which they use the entirety of to sponsor this video. JLC MC is like if Willy Wonka made a mechatronics website instead of a chocolate factory, and all the candy turned into Sour Patch Gears, Lollipolies, Gummy Bearings, you name it. They have an absurd amount of items on here that I have no clue what they are, but I want them. Like, what is that? I don't know, but I saw it, and now I need it. These parts are the cheapest you'll find while maintaining good quality. I mean, a metal spur gear for only $2? Yeah, I'll be taking six of those. JLC MC allows you to select from a wide range of parts, and even has a built-in 3D model viewer so you can make sure the part is the dimensions you want, or just download the CAD file and bring it into your modeling software. For this video, I grabbed a bunch of bearings, shafts, spur gears, a secret gear, and some pulleys. These puppies were packaged as if they were indeed puppies, and were swathed in foam and arrived unscathed. And when you create a JLC account, new members get $60 worth of coupons across all of JLC's sites, so if you need 3D printing services, printed circuit board fabrication, CNC machining services, or mechatronics parts, head over to JLC for some of those delicious coupons. Thank you again to JLC MC for sponsoring this video, now back to whatever it was I was doing. Oh yeah, gears. Now that I've got all these spiky discs, I need to do something with them. You've probably seen these ridiculous gearboxes with the Google to 1 or 2 milli to 1 gear ratios, which is frankly quite absurd. I just need to make a meager 350,000 to 1 gearbox in order to raise my carcass off of the floor. But hold on, the aforementioned gearboxes don't have gears with millions of teeth, so how are they getting such insane ratios? Let's ask our resident gear expert, Stephen Tyler. 
Thanks, Steve. By using the gear train with compound gears, where a small gear acts like a tumor to a big gear and turns with it, I can get my desired gear ratio. I assembled a fixture to test this theory and make sure my piece of crap motor could overcome our mutual hatred of friction. Will. It. Turn. The 64 to 1 gearbox was boxing the gears just fine until I introduced some resistance which instantly euthanized the motor. I had a feeling that may happen, so I bought a six pack of them and after tossing the used one away, cracked open a cold one with the intention of measuring the final output torque. The idea here was that I could record the amount of pressure the final gear was capable of by pressing down on the flat blade and the scale would record it. The motor had a different idea, however, and after having its fun also gave up the ghost. That's two down. I thought the jank test setup may have been the reason for the demise of a third of my motors, so I got serious and started dumping bearings on plastic, cut some 8mm shaft that I couldn't get out of my garage floor crack, and had way too hard of a time figuring out how my gears needed to mesh together. But the struggle was worth it, because in the end, it didn't work at all. It was simply too hard to turn the gears, and at first I thought it was my poor modeling skills that didn't mesh well with the solid metal gears, but after iterating at least twice I came to a horrifying realization. Friction is real. I felt sick from this discovery, as if millions of high school physics teachers suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. Now I did get the gearbox to turn, but the motor itself was going slow and almost all of my torque was being used on the friction of just turning the gears. And I blew up another motor in the process. With both gears being keyed to the shaft so they turn in phase, the whole shaft has to turn and the weight of that is three times the amount of the plastic compound gears. So unfortunately I had to save the heavy metal gears for a rainy day and print the gears to be as lightweight as possible. I then assembled the new gearbox with 9 compound gears for a total gear ratio of 262,144 to 1, and if the $1 motor can't drive this, I think this project has failed. Three, two, one. All good things must come to an abrupt end, and I blew up my fourth motor by putting some pressure on a gear, which some may call foreshadowing. But now I'm down to two motors, and the gearbox does technically work, so I'm just going to mount it to my elevator and see what happens. Wait, I forgot to make an elevator. Okay, the plan is to make a platform that raises and lowers from cables, and I believe this will be the world's first tailored elevator. I then went hunting with my trusty saw and returned with a plentiful harvest of 4x2s to screw together. The build started out all hunky-dory, until I stripped bits, put it together wrong, stripped myself, and then stripped the wood. As always, I made sure to get Home Depot's best pieces of lumber for such an important project, and after all that effort, I wound up with what an alien might make for a chair building contest despite never having seen a chair. Next I needed to make a platform, but one sheet of plywood was too bendy, so I doubled it and gave it to myself. I didn't have a third clamp for the center part, but my mama told me to be the change you want to see in the world, so I was stuck on a table in the garage for six hours. The double cheeked up platform was much stronger, and my idea is to use these steel cables to raise the platform like so. And where there's cables, there's pulleys, and where there's pulleys, there's shafties that need to have some simple, uneventful holes drilled. What? How? In wood? I finished drilling the rest of the holes for the shafts and took a page out of my Middle Eastern Brethren's book to cut the shaft to length. I then ran the cables through the platform and printed a cable drum, which most drummers can't play, and with the drum gear the final gear ratio is the coveted 350,000 to 1. And after choking the cable drum with cables just the way it likes, the platform could be raised and lowered by twisting the drum which was actually looking pretty promising, but the similarities between me and a $1 DC motor start and end with the shaft. Finally I mounted the gearbox to the elevator, and first needed to see if the elevator could even hold my weight. Oh. Okay. Turns out the gears were a little nervous and just needed some emotional support brackets installed which, being the mental health conscious man I am, happily obliged. Judgment Day hath finally arrived, and after so much struggle and heartbreak on this project, I really hoped it wouldn't be a complete failure. If I connect this motor and the gears don't move, I can- Three, two, one.
Okay, so they were moving, but barely. And you're never gonna believe this, but I burnt up the fifth motor. It's times like these that cheating was invented for, and after tossing Mambo number fa, grabbed the next size up motor which I could find a 10 pack for for $10, so it's still a $1 motor. This bigger motor had better shape out or ship up. Even though it looks like I forgot to take my meds, if I speed the footage up by 2000%, the drum did actually turn and the platform lifted up. Boys, we have an elevator on our hands. By my calculations, the drum should rotate once every 87 minutes, giving me over 12 inches of lift. That didn't matter though, because I immediately broke it when I stepped on the platform, and from then on only one side would lift up. A little WD-40 later, and I gave the elevator a final try to lift me, which, to its credit, still kept turning, and maybe if I stayed on there for a week, I would have traveled an inch. The elevator could still lift the platform though, and in the end, I knew there was only one proper thing to do. With five of his brothers in arms dying valiantly for this cause, it seemed only right that the lone survivor's destiny lay among the clouds formed by the collective last breath of his slain comrades. Godspeed, little one. Yeah, the driving gear flew off immediately and I broke the motor casing trying to put a new one on. Six.